Greetings and welcome to In-Depth, I'm DK Ronstar. Now, following Media Insights Power of Perception Workshop, we are happy to speak with two panelists at the event. Joining us are President of the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Industry and Commerce, one of the 23 women to watch in 2023, and a Managing Director of Caribbean Lifestyle Communications, Kiran Maharaj. We also are joined by someone who is charting her own path. She is an award-winning writer, a content marketer and strategist, and the founder of Sister Isle Digital and Lifestyle Mag, Ricolia Phillip. Thank you so much for joining us, ladies. And I am very happy for the juxtaposition of someone who says that her first love is radio in terms of looking at traditional media as well as things that can be on digital platforms. So, and let's start off with that, please, because we had a conversation a little earlier with Alison Dimas, and she was talking about the way that traditional media is entering uh, social platforms, digital platforms. So I'll ask you for your views on that, please, Kira. And hello, DK, and thank you for having me. And um, hello to all of your viewers. I know you don't have viewers just in Trinidad and Tobago, but uh, overseas as well. Uh, I think that what is happening is that we have recognized the fact that traditional cannot do without digital anymore. So even within the traditional media space, I, I say I love radio. It is my first love for many reasons, maybe because it's because the emotional connections are there. And if you get, you know, those emotions from music or from the vibe that the announcer gives out, then you clearly understand what I'm saying. So what has happened is obviously traditional media, all of us have also moved into the digital landscape. We do that through not just our websites, but also our social media platforms. Many of us employ um, elements such as Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, we do surveys using SurveyMonkey. You know, some of us are doing um, competitions now with entry forms on Google Forms. Um, a lot of us have mobile apps because you have to cater for the fact that you have this screen that's constantly in someone's hand. So what we are seeing is that it is. it seems to be a happy marriage thus far. Unless like every other relationship, you don't know the right things to do to make it work, which means you need, you need to take time to observe and understand your audiences, um, what influences them, what their interests are, what their typical life is like on a daily basis, what their routines are. So again, even with trying to understand the lifestyle aspects um, that we have to observe to employ the right strategies for digital it goes back to what traditional was. And so I think that where we are at now is understanding, let's hold hands and let's go up this road together. I find there's a way that you have the, you, you just put in that word lifestyle there. I don't know if it's practice, but let me let me bring you in please, Ms. Philip. in terms of sometimes it seems as though, well, as Ms. Maraj would have said, happy marriage until, what are some of those things that people who are more uh, entrenched in the traditional media space, what are some of the challenges they find when they're trying to bring their platforms to digital, digital, digital spaces? The first thing that comes to mind is, I'm kind of thinking still in the mind of, you know, what we were discussing last week at Media Insights Workshop is data. You know, it is, very challenging to track effectively how well traditional has worked in the same way that digital can. Um, additionally, it's a bit of a challenge as well to really, in the same in, when you want to compare it to digital, like truly understand your audience. Um, it's a it's a challenge to see like how it's performing, how people are engaging with it, what they like, what they don't like, and but at the same time. I think we need to understand, as, as Kieran rightly said, it is a happy marriage. I think the conversation for a while has been digital versus traditional. And I believe that both play a very integral part in marketing on a whole. 
and they can lean into each other in different ways. They can play off to each other in different ways. So I think it, it definitely is a situation of understanding the strengths of each and finding that happy medium to integrate both. If I could just add to that, Tiki, um, based on what you know, Rikul is saying is, is when we look at data, she made a point last week that I have firmly believed in, and I mentioned it at the Media Insight panel, which is not just the demographics anymore, just the numbers, but we have to look at the qualitative data because with more and more, we have to qualify the audiences. We all might have the same format or the same chicken as they say, but how we prepare it and the seasonings we use are all very different. And I think that as marketers, and almost everybody in business today is a marketer, right? Because we have to understand how we sell our goods and services to the consumer. We remember this term, AIDA, attention, interest, desire, and action. And one of the key things about fulfilling our objectives with that is understanding that now instead of one pipeline to get your message out to achieve this ADA, you now have several. So it is a matter of which pipelines you want to use for the maximum reach and so the benefit for your entity at the end of the day. And you see you're picking my mouth, you're carrying them down roads, and I'm very happy to dive down these rabbit holes, but even like looking at the importance of studies in fields like psychology and history, and um, because I can go, I can go to the terms and co for in terms like go back and get it. So looking to see what works in order to influence current activities towards future ones. Uh, people talk about praxis in terms of uh, you, you have an action and you think about it, you do it, and then you reflect on it in, in order to go forward again. But and, and I see both of you nodding, ladies, but and let me go to you, please, Ricolia, and then I'll actually come back to you, Kiran, in terms of how important is it that we don't look at uh, grouping as a monolith and we are trying to literally get into their head to see what is happening so we can see how we can serve them a little better. Yeah, definitely. So I know we generally say understanding your, your audience is very important, but you know, what does that mean? You know, here I made a point last week with regards to, you know, it's more than the demographics, the psychographics as well. I'm sure we've all looked at content or ads or even if we're on social at any point in time, and you see a piece of content that feels as if it just reminds you of a conversation that you had with a friend a few days ago, or a, a message that she would have sent to that friend or a particular Google search that she would have made recently. You know, all of that is actually very intentional. That is, you know, a, a sign of retargeting. That's something that's done in the digital space. So essentially what happens is based on your search intent, based on uh, the things that you are interacting with and all of that, uh, social media and the web will start to show you more content uh, based on your interests. And that is why it's critical to understand, yes, where someone lives and, you know, uh, their age groupings and that sort of thing, but also understanding what makes them tick, you know, what do they like, what they don't like, what do they value, what do they not value. And as marketers and as who are representatives of a company as well, this is where it's important as well to be very strong and firm in what your brand values are, what your brand ethics are and all of that. Because at this point in, in the game, it's more than just selling a product or service. It's it's who that brand is. You know, brands are a personality at this point in time. And especially in this age, you know, we always say, you know, in this economy, but yes, in this economy, people are so much more conscious about how they're spending their money, where they're spending their money as well. Uh, yes, a lot of them are looking for a good deal and all of that, but they also are conscious of who they're buying from. So, for example, if you are an individual that is very big on the environment, you are uh, you, you you fancy yourself to be an activist and you realize that the brands that you are buying from, you know, there was a study that came out that they a lot of their work, a lot of their products are as a result of child labor or, you know, they are very big on pollution. A lot of what they their, their operations is 
it results in a lot of pollution. As a consumer now, you would say, well, this doesn't align with what I stand for, I'm very conscious about the environment. I'm very big on, you know, recycling and, you know, just doing my part. So I will not choose to purchase from this company or they're involved in child labor. No, I don't want to be a part of that. So understanding, this is what, again, coming back to understanding who your audience is, what they value as well is very important. And also showcasing uh, not just your brand values and ethics, but ensuring that your messaging is targeting that very specific group. So if you are an ethical brand, uh, more than just saying that your product is ethically made, you will also want to highlight how it is ethically made, what are your sustainable practices and all of that. And it also comes back to the notion of not everyone is a customer. And that's okay. You know, once you are very clear and you're laser focused on who your community is, who your target audience is, it makes the your marketing messages, it makes the branding, it makes everything so much more easier to translate. And then coming back to what I said at the start of this, the the end user, which is the consumer and the potential customer, they feel as if, okay, this company is talking to me. Thank you so much. And let me ask you the same question, Kiran, but also put in the added caveat as of how do you do this? when you're not necessarily or it may be a brand that is not trying to put itself forward as a brand as opposed to having the content in front of what it is i think you have to remember that right now the, the peripheral vision of consumers is very much um alive right because you're in a community now where people can actually give feedback comment thumbs up stars right they review everything so you can't really get away from it um so i think that's the first thing you have to remember that whatever you're doing you need to really live up to the image you really want to project because if you don't um you, you're going to be in for some big trouble right you'll be in hot water and once you start on things like social media the other thing to remember is your response time to consumers and what you say to them is in now is in a public space so you have to also be careful with that. So we could go crazy because the universe, you know, has many tentacles now available to us. So you really have to drill down on what makes sense for you. Look at the size of your business. Look at where your greatest opportunity for reach is and how are you going to maintain and sustain your marketability. And I, I feel that having, you know, multiple, whether it's traditional media and lots of radio stations, multiple social media outlets, I actually think it's a good thing and not a bad thing because it means you can narrow in a little bit more. When it was just traditional radio, we didn't have these digital platforms, you know, you spend X number of dollars and it's kind of, sometimes it's like a scattershot, okay? And as we started to develop and the landscape became you know, more stations um, for radio and TV, more newspapers, and now digital, you can actually zero in to your target audience. So I think it means that you have to really look for the insights, which is why I think we don't use data properly. We don't use it sufficiently. I find that businesses shy away from it when they really shouldn't. And it means that every business owner, I'm not talking about the marketers alone, the business owners are the ones who direct the vision. They really need to understand how to interpret data because once they understand how to interpret it, they are able to better internally communicate to those marketing and sales teams and their branding teams as to, guys, this is the vision, so this is what is being suggested. And then the marketing team can take that and build it out and get into the nitty gritty. But I think that what we have to recognize is that as decision makers, we need to understand the value of the data and insights. If I may add to that as well. Uh, so I think she's absolutely right in terms of, you know, at the end of the day, it's the business owner, the, you know, they're at the top. They're the ones that are driving these things. And it's, of course, it's up to them to fully understand this. I think part of what plays a role in this is we still have a lot of people who 
have not been able to make the distinction and understand that there is a massive difference between social media for fun, you know, me posting photos of my last trip and the kids and my pets and all of that versus social media for business. It is a completely different playing ground. Uh, the rules are completely different. It is, and it's been advancing very rapidly over the years. And the not just the tools that are there to help businesses make more informed decisions, but I would say, I would go so far as to say that in the same way that, you know, any business would employ, you know, the best of the best when it comes to their operations, whether it's, you know, HR software, finance software, and all these different things, social media for business, being very clear on that, social media and digital marketing for business, given the massive amount of tools and access and insights and data and all of that that come with it should really be looked at and perceived as a, a not just another uh, very viable and powerful tool of operation for business. I think that is very critical. I want you to stick a pin there, please, because right now, as it stands, we're going to have a big half and a small half of the conversation. But we, can, we continue with the conversation when we return. We are speaking with Rikolia Phillip and Kiran Maharaj. Stay with us. We come back after this. Welcome back. We are having a conversation that would have stemmed from an initial uh, panel discussion at Media Insights Perception or Power of Perception Workshop. And we're speaking with Rikolia Philip as well as Kiran Maharaj. And one of the things that we, well, that you would have just touched on before the break, Rikolia, and I want to go into that because the impact of or an influence of a digital presence is really something and how it is you wield that whether or not you're wielding it for personal interests or professional interests also plays a major part in how people perceive you i tell people i am so glad that when i was doing the most when eventually mobile phones were on the scenes they were not smart because we would not be having this conversation and it can be a very slippery slope so what are some of those what are some of those i guess do's and don'ts uh, rules of thumb to make that distinction between using digital platforms for personal means or for personal uses as well or versus for professional. So let me start from the business side, right? Your employees are your brand ambassadors, whether or not you have recognized that. So for companies who know that their brand is out there and there's certain um, characteristics they want to clearly portray, they need to clearly identify the members of staff who they know would serve as public brand ambassadors. And there has to be a social media policy. There has to be a digital policy because you can't profess to be this company, company XYZ doing ABC, and then an agent of your company goes out there and is acting in a totally different way. So it has to start with the humans right? Um, and so you need to have social media policies. The other part of it is, you know, you can have brands, um, products and services who want to market themselves differently to different audiences. And um, recall, yeah, I know we'll get into that right after me, but I think the important thing to remember is what are we projecting on our YouTube page and how are we doing it as opposed to are we projecting the same thing, but in a fun way on Instagram? And then you have the whole idea of influencers. Most influencers are there because they represent the characteristics and values of certain target audiences. But we have to go back to, I always go back to the basics, you know, Maslow's theory of self-actualization. That's why we have filters on everything. You can make yourself look good no matter how bad a day you're having. But also the influence represent this, right, for a lot of people. And so people want to hear what they say. They want to look like that. They want to be like them. They're, they are celebrities, 
Okay, so how we even employ influences into the conversation and our strategies um, becomes very important. And there needs to be some policies and rules. That's why I think that companies who actually grow their influencers, it may be better for them long term than just hiring influencers. It really depends on what you want to do and what you want to capture. But consideration has to be given to those things. So I'm going to stop there because I know Rekulia has a lot more experience in this day to day than I do. I'm smiling no, because you actually... you, you're speaking and I'm, I'm feeling like a dashboard puppy because I'm just here. I'm just here. <laughs> but let me bring in, let me bring in, please, Ms. Fuller. Yeah, no, Karen, you actually hit a lot of nails on the head. So I think I'll probably just expand a bit more. So you're, she's absolutely right when it comes to employees representing the company. And there definitely needs to be, in, I guess, like the overarching uh company policy something provisions for digital and social um they are representative of you it's more than just you know wearing a, a branded polo at this point in time uh coming extending into you know influencers as well i have i'll be very honest i have a bit of a, a love-hate relationship when it comes to influencer marketing in trinidad and that's because i feel like we're just we're we're not hissing it where we need to and as you know we Kieran mentioned that employees are an extension of the business or the company. And I think we also need to look at influencers as well as a temporary extension of the company as well. So yes, of course, we want them to target a particular group or demographic or uh, interest group or whatever the case may be. But we also have to keep in mind that their views um, and things that they may say and do as in said influencer outside of the content that they're creating for you, depending on the size of the following of said influencer, if it's not aligned with your company and your company values, there can be a lot of blowback as well. So in crafting the influencer uh, agreement or contract or whatever the case is, something should also be uh, stipulated that the influencer knows that there's certain things that they can and cannot say or do, and even if it's just for like the the, the period of engagement. Uh, so there's no there's no level of blowback on them. Additionally, to even avoid all of that, you also want to pay attention to not just static numbers. So having let's say ten thousand followers is not enough in in this game when it comes to influencer marketing. You know, you want to also take a look at their values as well. So if let's say they have a very large following, but the things that they talk about, the things that they represent, if they're not aligned with the company, they may not be the influencer for you. Um, coming back to more generalized perspective, uh, you had asked earlier about the differences between uh, business and personal and all of that. Something as simple as when you're setting up your accounts, all social media accounts right now have allow you to create accounts for personal use and for business. So you'd notice that there are a lot of business pages and, and that sort of thing. And that is for a reason. Once you sign up for an account as a business page, you'd be afforded completely different tools and access that your personal page would not be, would not have access to. Um, some do's and don'ts as well include, including Diversifying your content, yes. If you are a corporate entity, I know a lot of corporate entities struggle with this in the social and digital space. If let's say they are in the financial uh, space or let's say in accounting or whatever, uh, they tend to want to adopt the same corporate personality onto their social media. And what we have to keep in mind is that most platforms, I would say, to a smaller, lesser extent to, let's say, like the LinkedIn's of things. But most social media platforms are, you know, people go there for entertainment, yes, for inf information and all of that, but they're going there to be entertained. They're going there on their downtime. So they're not necessarily always going there for, you know, the, the super corporate talk and that sort of thing. Of course, there's a time and place for it. But if it is as a business, you really want to reach a particular audience and showcase, you know, the the less informal side of things or showcase company culture or showcase the, the overarching personality of your brand, it's very important to have a very specific strategy for how you want to show up. And Kira made a very great point in terms of this is where being on different platforms serves you. So if again, if you are a corporate entity, you can showcase your uh, thought leadership 
and your insight, you can be an authority in your niche on LinkedIn, you know, even to a small extent on YouTube as well. If you want to show up on, let's say, Facebook and well, Instagram and like TikTok, depending on the business, there may be the spaces you'd want to showcase, you know, company culture, um, strategically leaning into um, what's trending at the moment, but tying it back into the business and all of that. Even if you want to showcase thought leadership there, you still want to do it in a way that's digestible. It's something that people would, you know, take away from it saying, you know what, hmm, I, I, I gained something from that. And there's so many great examples worldwide where you see a lot of major businesses, major companies where they're known to be one of the, the biggest, like in terms of corporate entities, but their social media says something completely different. So again, this is where understanding your audience comes into play. Who are you trying to reach here? What are you trying to say on these different platforms? And the the notion of just copying and pasting everything across all platforms, that's sort of out, out the door at this point in time. Yeah, if so I could just... Me, even if, what I'm going to do is try to crave your indulgence, ladies, because we are fantastic fantastically out of time on television but the good thing is that social media platforms allow us to go a little further so i'm craving intelligence for about seven more minutes but on behalf of the entire ttt news team this has been in depth with me dk ronstar we've been speaking with kira maharaj we've been speaking with ricolia philip and if you tune in on one of the digital platforms the conversation continues but if not thank you so much for joining us Welcome back. If you are looking at this at this point in time, that means that you're on a digital platform. Thank you. And the, con the conversation it continues with Kiran Maharaj as well as Ricolia Philip. Now, you are going to make a point to what it is Ricolia said, Kiran. Please feel free. Yeah, I think I need to urge a little caution here with brands who are um, on, on social media, in particular Facebook and Instagram. You know, I've had clients come to me and say they don't find that they have as much engagement as they would like. And yes, I understand all of that. But I want to give you an experience I had with our stations when we, we started our social media. You know, you put things up like the news and all of that because, you know, people want that, right? But you don't see as many shares or reposts or responses and comments. But the day I put up a picture of the shoes, my funky shoes that I wore in the office, it was like mind-blowing, right? I'm like, people are on the social media. You know, and I think we have to remind ourselves that not everything we post will get the engagement. And then it also depends on the audience. Our audiences, you know, for some of the, the, the stations I have, my brands, they are not the ones who are going to be playing on social media all day. But if they see something that they find is really cute and sensational, they're going to like it. If they see something that they think impacts them, like we were promoting getting the vaccine, which I didn't think we would have had as much. We, we had some negativity, let's say, with one of the stations at the start of the whole thing, right? At the start of COVID, I think everybody. But within four hours, you get over a thousand comments. You know, um, that says a lot. So I think that understanding the audience will help you to not go crazy when you think they are not paying attention. So read through again, read through the data and read through who you're trying to reach to really understand if what you're doing is making sense for you. Okay, so there are two questions that I have, one for each of you. And I really, and this is following because I love the fact that you both have been citing or referencing the panel discussion. And because if you miss that, but Ms. Philip, I want to ask you, how do you speak truth to power, especially if someone has asked you to come in and provide a service and share insight, but then they don't necessarily like what it is you're telling? This is actually where I let the data speak for itself. You know, um, a lot of I've recognized from my personal experience working with businesses and even, you know, when I was working full time, you know, for uh, companies, a lot of times they, the decision makers, 
they want to move in a particular direction. They want to make decisions. They want to say things based off of feelings and based of what they saw somewhere. And well, the competition is doing this and X, Y, and Z. And then I always say, you know, I don't go off of feelings. I, I don't go off of vibes. I go off of data. I go off of the numbers. So even if let's say, because at the end of the day, as my, my job is to, yes, execute in terms of managing the social media, managing your digital, uh, your your ads and this and the other. And of course, the strategy side of things, um, my job still is also to advise. And I can advise you as much as possible. I can advise based on things that I've, you know, things that I'm involved in this on a day to day. And I can say, I think this is the best decision that what the direction we should go into. But at the end of the day, if the head wants to go in the opposite direction, okay. At the end of it, though, I can say, you know, I know you wanted to go in this particular direction. Um, however, the numbers are not supporting this decision. And this is why. And I think this is why we need to give things a chance. I also say, and it's something that I mentioned last week at the conference, uh, social and digital marketing on a whole, we need to treat it like a social science. We need to look at it as you know, in the same way that we approach things like sociology and psychology, you know, you put your theory out, um, you are marrying qualitative and quantitative data, and you are, based on your theory, you can go in a particular way, and if the results show up some, uh, in a different direction, you adjust your theory accordingly, and it's the same thing with digital marketing in a whole. I can put forward a theory or my strategy based on uh, the research that I've done, based on you know where the numbers are right now. But at the end of the day, we still have to respond almost in real time based on how our audience is responding and reacting and interacting with the content. If they are react interacting with the content in the way that we would like them to, or the way that we predicted them to, then we can continue down a particular trajectory and road. If not, we need to, you know, go back to the drawing board and say, okay, well, again, based on the data, why is this? Is it the time of day? Is it the type of content? Is it the subject matter? Like, what is it? And then once we've assessed based on the data why things are not performing the way we would like it then we can go back and re-strategize and adjust our strategy to suit so it, at the end of the day data is critical in everything that we're doing in the digital realm and having that close by in all of our decision making uh processes the two things one i really like the fact that you talk about triangulating uh results in terms of using both quantitative and qualitative because the numbers may say that these three people did took undertook this action but then that qualitative study will give you an idea of why they did so why? and that may make you want to speak to each of those individuals in a different manner but exactly. we have about four minutes more and it belongs to you Ms. Maraj in terms of policy making Everyone will have their idiosyncrasies. Everyone has a different story. But in terms of like those first steps, when it comes to leveraging the insight that would have been gained and how you begin to move forward, thank you. How, how, how do we start to approach something like that? All businesses, products, and services, micro, small, medium, large, need to understand that research and marketing has to be part of your budget annually right you you can't want to attract people to your goods and services without understanding if you are getting the right people and getting the amount of people and what strategies you need to employ it has never made sense to me and as business owners you know and and i hear this all the time on both sides of the discussion traditional and digital the first thing that gets cut is marketing but to me that's not the first thing that should get cut the first thing you should do is move your marketing budget into your research budget, right? Because something is not happening. You're not getting to where you want to go because of a certain reason. But do you know what the reason is? And very often when I pose that question, um, they don't know. And data has always been important for traditional media. We've done it in different ways. So Recolia was talking about, you know, re-examining what you're doing and looking at the placements and all of that. But we've done the same thing in radio and TV and print for years, especially radio and TV. You call your client one week into the campaign to find out what the results were like 
And when it's not working the way they think, you go back in and you see, okay, is it because I needed to move my placements from daytime to drive time? Is it because the call to action and the script was not strong enough? Is it because I needed to book more spots within the day because this this event or the sales need to be pushed into the weekend? We've always done that. And so we need to understand this is not something new. The way we're doing it is what has changed. The other aspect in that that I think companies need to um to really get a handle on, and it goes, I want to say this especially to the MSMEs, because I know it's difficult. I know it's challenging. You're trying to pay all your bills and get your business going. You want to scale, you have to pivot. But you know, you have to really plan properly and do it the right way. So if you know that you are in the market, don't say you have this small budget and it has to work. No, it is better you get to a place where you know you have sufficient budget to what you want to do to put yourselves out there. So it takes planning and it takes some strategizing. And I think that we need to learn from each other. In Trinidad and Tobago, one thing I can tell you is when you say to somebody, I need your help to understand, you will get, yes, let's talk. I have never in my entire career from a humble sales rep to where I am now, right? As a media owner, still humble, right? But I have never had anybody say, we can't help you or we don't, we don't have time to, to help you understand. And I think that that is one of the areas that a lot of MSMEs, they are afraid to ask for advice um, and they shouldn't be. And I want to encourage them to ask for that advice from friends and family or peers who they know. And mentorship becomes very important. I know that's a separate discussion, but it is actually very important with what we're talking about because at the end of the day, you have people who don't have the background in all of this, but there are people who do and we need to share the experiences. So in terms of policies, look at your planning, look at your um, how you're going to implement and make research and marketing part of your investment. These are not expenses. These are investments into the longevity of your businesses. With that, we want to thank you so much, ladies, Kiran Maharaj, as well as Rikolia Philip. And like I said, if you missed out before, you missed a treat, but we're very grateful for this conversation that we just would have had. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team that has been in depth with me, DK Rockstar, thank you so much for that.